I am as sad as the movie was. I am a very big fan of it. Um, I watched it. Nothing was on Netflix, and I am a Sea World lover. I watched it, and uh, it definitely put my eyes in a different perspective. Um, I. I'm taking an English class. I'm just finishing up school, and I have to write a research paper. Um, and this is a, an, an interest that really hit me. So I uh, reached out to Dr. Ventry via Twitter, and then he had told me you were going to be with him. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to interview both of you. Um, so I do want to thank both of you again for meeting with me tonight. You're welcome. You're welcome. When you guys started at SeaWorld, what was the training process? Was it you know, you watched a video and then you were, you had to perform like 30 hours or something like that. And then you trained with the whales. How did they train you guys for that? Well, it was all on the job training. Um, and, you know, most of the people that we worked with and around and even the supervisors, very few of them had any kind of formal degrees, um, huh. much more than a high school education. So there was not really any kind of protocol in place in terms of educational requirements. Right. Uh, you had to pass a swim test, and that's essentially uh, all, all it was. And uh, and so you arrived, and they essentially, you kind of watched, you kind of carried buckets around and scrubbed them for uh, a while at Shamu Stadium for the better part of a year. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of slowly started getting more and more interactions with the animals as you kind of learned how to interact with them. Um, but it was all on-the-job training. Now, Dr. Venture, you mentioned you took scuba lessons and you got scuba certified. So that wasn't required. That was got. that was one of the prerequisites. You it was. You didn't okay. need a college education, but you did need a, a scuba certification. And okay. uh, as uh, I think Dr. Duffus points out in the film, that training probably helped Ken Peters out fairly well when he got drugged down to the bottom rapidly by Kasaka in right. uh, 2007, I believe that was. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, now, were there trainer, were there classes that you guys had to take, you know, every so often that were updated on safety measures, um, you know, like every six months or something along those kinds of lines? Yeah. So uh, we had to take uh, first aid training, CPR. You had to be CPR certified, and and you had to have uh, have that um, current. And then we went through first aid training, and, and uh, I think once every couple of years or something, we had to do uh, water rescue training. Uh, and I think that was about it. I don't recall any other really, uh, any formalized training per se. <laughs> well, I'll add two things to that. Number one, they did give us public relations training. Public relations training. And they did give us voice lessons. So those two things are kind of more related to how to handle tough questions from the audience. And also uh -huh. how to speak from the diaphragm, so to speak, you know, so people, right. it's a show. And yet people need to remember that you get hired at SeaWorld based on how you look in a wetsuit or how you uh, look in front of a camera, not based on any scientific training that you've had, because it is all on the job. With the, uh, the public relations aspect of it, um, you know, you said they had taught you what to say, how to answer questions in the audience. Do you believe that SeaWorld was kind of trying to feed you information and it wasn't, you know, something that you could answer? Yes, I'm right with that? Okay. Yes. okay. Absolutely. Uh, That's exactly what it was for. It was really uh, to, to, to disseminate the corporate talking points to us. Another way that they did it was through the educational show scripts. We were, uh -huh. you know, I personally went out there and used the line from the, sh the movie Blackfish, you know, 25 to 35 years, you know, 20 right. some percent of uh, killer whale. Actually, that stat wasn't out yet. That got published in 98. But we were told that dorsal fin collapse was uh, normal, common, basically. was common in wild killer whales. So what, what we were basically were, were the mouthpiece for the corporate spin um, put on their captive animals. And so we were told what to say, how to say it, and how to uh, disseminate this information to a sometimes skeptical public. And, um, and so, you know, most of us were, uh, you know, pretty naive at the time, at least I was, I'll speak for my own self. Um, right. and, and so you kind of just did what you were told. Um, although, you know, behind the scenes, we were kind of, at least some of us were kind of questioning, hey, hey, is this, uh, is this stuff kind of accurate or, you know, is this some of this nonsense because it's not really uh, coinciding with what we're seeing in the pools. 
Right. But um, yeah, so we were just mouthpieces for the, the corporate spin. And uh, the I guess it's safe to say that at least uh, a big part of what's happened since Dawn was killed uh, has sprouted directly from conversations that, that John and I had back in the early 1990s through 1995 and beyond then. We were talking about these issues amongst ourselves. And as we learned more information from outside sources, for example, for example, I was communicating with Ken Balcom and Dr. Astrid Van Ginniken of Orca Survey and, you know, getting told longevity numbers that were in direct contradiction with what we were being asked to say as fact to young school children. And one other caveat to that is I believe it was uh, Florida state policy that all middle school kids or maybe younger had to attend SeaWorld as part of the curriculum of the Florida state public school system, which in hindsight, it's just another avenue for SeaWorld to deploy its corporate talking points and impregnate those points into young kids. Which are then future customers. Right. So then let me ask you this, because um, you said you were questioning, you know, everything they were telling you. What was their response when you had questioned them? Or did well, they not have one? Well, so let me clarify. Um, for example, Dr. Ventry and I were talking about some of these animal issues behind closed doors we weren't mentioning these things to management or okay. to our supervisors because we would have been you know reprimanded at best and probably fired at worst and right. so you know what i'm saying is you know we'd go out for beers or something at the local bennigan's and, and we would talk amongst ourselves you know if the public ever finds out about these things and it's uh it's not going to work out very well for sea world and that's what we're seeing right now the uh the veil or the curtain has been drawn back in large mm -hmm. part due to the, the film that you saw in Blackfish and as well as David Kirby's book and the writing of people like Tim Zimmerman and Outside Magazine as well as Elizabeth Batt and Candace Whiting and a lot of people have been working on this uh, especially since 2010 but several people prior to 2010 as well. So let me ask you this then because um, you know I did do a little bit of research when I had watched the video and they uh, had shown the clip where some people who were employed with SeaWorld were saying, you know, 25 to 30 years was their lifespan. And I'm like, well, I'm going to look it up. And I looked it up. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, on SeaWorld's website, they had said the average lifespan of a male is 19 years and female is 30 years. When I looked it up online, they said the average can be anywhere from 50 to 80 years. Is that correct? Well, I will, but let me introduce this because JJ happens to be, I think, probably the world's leading expert, at least in captive killer whale survival. And, and we're presenting some information both on health and survival in Moscow, Idaho, for a screening at the University of Idaho tomorrow. Right. Um, so I'll let him answer that question. But uh, he's done the most detailed statistical analysis of captive killer whale survival that has ever been done. So, so let, let's, let's talk about females. So roughly 60% or something of females in the wild live to the age of 40. 40, about okay. 60% or something. Upwards okay. of 70%. In captivity, about 2% have lived to the age of 40 plus. Okay. 2% versus 60%. That's a remarkable difference. Right. Um, I, when I, we give our presentation at the University of Idaho, uh, my first slide is a picture of a whale named Granny, and Granny is roughly 103 years old. And, wow. you know, that's a wild killer whale. Okay. That's completely, you know, unheard of for any animal in a tank. Um, and so we're talking about survival differences that are completely different um, from wild to the captive environment. And one thing to add to that is that a lot of the wild studies have been done to insulted populations. I mean, the most accessible killer whales that are known to science live here in Washington and in, in Canada and Alaska, the southern and the northern residents. They are most known because they predictably come in and feed on salmon every year. And these mm -hmm. populations are stressed from the salmon decline and pollutants that humans have added in the water. I've told John, Dr. Jett privately that I bet you if you went down to the Southern Ocean and did longevity studies on type A, B, and C, and Arctic species, you'd probably find a lot of grannies. 
there was a bowhead whale that was speared by some Alaskan natives. I think it was Alaska, maybe North Canadian Alaska uh, natives. Um, probably, I think it's 2012, maybe 2013. Mm. This whale, when they processed it, they cut it up. They're allowed to take the take so many of these whales uh, a year for subsistence hunting. They found a projectile point, a spear tip, uh, in embedded in this whale's carcass. And when they uh, carbon dated it, it turned out that the whale was like 136 years old. So mm. these these animals in the wild when they're not being preyed upon by man or mm -hmm. not being uh, forced to eat contaminated food can live a lot longer. And I suspect that's a, the same with killer whales as well. Okay, so then can I ask, I think I have an idea, but why is SeaWorld telling everyone this is the average lifespan of killer whales? Is it because they live a shorter life in captivity? Well, let, so there's a, there's a statistic that you should know. Um, the point, and this is a remarkable figure, the point at which 50% of the animals are dead mm -hmm. is roughly age seven in captivity. So oh, wow. by the age of seven, about half of the animals in captivity have died, oh, right? Wow. Um, okay. That's crazy. Yeah. That cohort is, you know, has a very low mortality. Infant mortality is high in the wild. It's, okay. it's pretty high. But roughly the same as in captivity. So we're talking about zero to a year old. They're about huh. the same as in captivity. So actually the guys at SeaWorld and in marine parks, they do pretty well with newborns. They live okay. roughly the same. Uh, they have about the same mortality as they do in the wild. But okay. mortality in the wild from about one to a roughly age six or seven is, is very low in the wild, but it's right. very high in captivity. It's off the charts. It's not even comparable. Um, and so, um, and so you're talking really apples to oranges. So I think, um, uh, in, in the movie, um, Howard Garrett says that killer whales in the wild live roughly human lifespans. And that's mm -hmm. pretty accurate. I think that that is a reasonable way to describe their, their, um, kind of average lifespan. Uh, and in captivity, that's not that's not accurate at all. In your time true. at SeaWorld, were there whales that they didn't show? Do they retire whales? If they do, do they, as terrible as it sounds, do they keep them? No animals ever retired from SeaWorld. Um, all killer whales... Um, you work know, until they die. die? Exactly. They work until they die. Now, we had one whale, her name was Nootka, that... Um, as far as I know, was never put in shows. Um, right. She was not, you know, some whales just came from sea land, She right? came from yeah. sea land. Some whales and just died not long after. And, she came and, and died not too. But but we we were trying to train her for show parts, and uh, Nuka was not an animal that uh, was easy to train. She wasn't suited for the captive environment at all, and mm -hmm. uh, and she never did shows, and she died shortly after. In fact, I don't even remember how Nuka died something to do with the pregnancy i think yeah um but uh yeah but they don't get retired their okay. retirement is uh getting shipped to the rendering plant <clears throat> oh okay well that's uh wow so you guys mention um, a lot you guys talk about spotters a lot and obviously um you know spotters are very uh important how many spotters were assigned to you guys and what are i mean are there main roles that spotters have when they're when you guys were with them, I mean... The spotter's main job is to make the call of when to call the animals back to stage initially. And okay. Then, and then to sound the bigger alarm if needed. And that's basically the role of the spotter. The spotter is uh, is required. You're not supposed to do, like, I think the gal's name was Tamari in the film, was playing with orchids with yes, her feet. She did not have a spotter. And, and that's a perfect example of why spotters were needed. And still mm -hmm. are needed, um, and so that that's it's the safety spotters. Whether you're working out in a gym and you got a spotter there helping you lift the weights, it's there for to, to help you not get killed. 
Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Ventry, you, um, there was a part in the movie, you were on stage and you, I don't know if it was live or if you guys were just, but you were uh, talking about, you know, like the waterworks were all thought out and then this whale just kind of like slides across the stage while you're talking and, you know, you're laughing and kind of brushing it off. Was that planned? Yes was and no. Here's, here's how it was and here's how, uh, that was Mark Simmons, who's also in the film, sent Taima. And uh -huh. we, we did stage it like that. She okay. just came up a little bit earlier and made it look more oh. real. And so people ask all that, you know, use that as an example of how the movie was deceitful or something like that. I think the point is, is that you don't have to be uh, killed by the animal because it's trying to kill you to get hurt. Right. You can just get rammed by an animal. Like uh, I think John Hargrove in the film has a bloody face. He That wasn't yeah. an aggressive move that hurt him. It was him getting slammed into a solid structure by a, a rambunctious animal i think that was pushing him too hard so i think mm -hmm. you know a lot of times you know serial nitpicks at things and try to say well that wasn't an act of aggression i don't think anyone really said it was an act of aggression but it was juxtaposed with me saying a line on the mic that something you'll see nowhere else in the world these these this is a dangerous maneuver we're doing here watch out then whoa right. You know, and then that's kind of, that that was staged. Taima came up early. I had to jump uh -huh. out of the way, and uh, it, it obviously worked. It got picked for the movie. <laughs> uh, now, Doctor Jet, you worked. I could you say you worked pretty closely with Telecom? Then? Yeah, yeah, I worked with Telecom a lot. Um, so I mean, obviously, it's it's a killer whale, but did you? He wasn't. Did you? In your opinion, do you think he's a violent whale? I mean. No, I don't think he's a violent whale. I think Tilikum is a very bored whale. Okay. And so, you, you know, I, it, it, I'm guessing what you're kind of alluding to, you know, was it an aggressive act towards Don? Right. And, and that's the million dollar question. We don't know what was going through Tilikum's mind, but my interpretation, and everybody's got an interpretation, <clears throat> my interpretation is that Tilikum lives an exceedingly bored life in a crappy setup. He's chronically sunburned. His mouth hurts. He doesn't feel good. He's picked on by the whales around him, which is basically all the whales around him, uh -huh. right? His life is a drag. And he had an opportunity to um, procure a, a really novel experience, and that's what he did. And he had fun for, for 30 minutes or an hour or however long he had Don. And, uh, and so it broke up a, a, an otherwise dull day for him. So then it, it, it kind of sounds like even though Tillicum was doing, obviously, what he was doing, it was kind of an act of play almost? Well, uh, and, and that's a good question. And, and I think what I've said before, I think it's still accurate, and it's still my assessment, is that it probably began as something that was interesting for him, uh -huh. whether it was play or not. I don't, I don't know if they even see it as play but it was interesting probably right. and it it appeared to become possessive possession or aggression when the trainers tried to intervene mm -hmm. and at that point Tillicum said no this body is mine and right. that's when he became very serious about keeping Don and that's when he ripped her arm off and scalped her and you know right. did what he did with her and dragged her around by the way and had to be pried out of his mouth Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, I think it escalated once they, you know, sounded the alarm, pulled the nets, and did all the rigmarole that they were they were trying to do. Keep in mind that Tillicum had already it pulled in Kelty for sure, and yeah. probably pulled in Daniel Dukes for sure. As Samantha Berg has pointed out many times, it's unlikely that this guy's dipping his big toe in the water and says, I'm just going to jump in. I think he probably was testing the water. Tillicum came over. As John said in the film, he picked the wrong pool. He pulled well, yeah. in, and then, and then that was it. And then Tillicum, you know, had shown with Kelty and with uh, Daniel Dukes that once he gets something like that in the water, he intends on keeping it. I think in the case of Dawn, because it was public, I think within maybe 20 seconds or so, you had sirens going off people mm -hmm. banging on the wall people freaking out literally freaking out banging right. on the glass screaming noising escalated human screams dawn screaming right uh, because that was in a live audience she was doing dine with shamu right. when that incident occurred so shit 
hit the fan. And, right. Uh, and then and then Tilikum uh, went off, went crazy, went berserk. It's very interesting if you, and, and it's not yeah. captured in the movie, but if you watch the video footage, of, and it was helicopter footage, mm -hmm. and it was in real time when Don's body, and I don't mean to sound morbid, so pardon no, me. No, I understand. It's, I understand. Just, it's just my sort of, you know, observation. And, and I was watching it going, oh my God, he's not done with her. So they had retrieved Don's body. At this time, Tillicum was in the very small medical pool. He couldn't escape from the medical pool. That's where they, they got her body out. They had pulled her body out, placed it on the concrete next to the pool, and had put a blanket over her. Right. Tillicum was coming out over the pool ledge, His about a third of his body was out over the concrete looking with his eye at Don's body. He wanted it back. And right. even when she was laying on the concrete, he wasn't done. And so um, at one point then, Laura Cervix says, you got to get this body out of here. And they pulled her way back because it was exciting, Telecom. He wanted the body back. Right. Um, um, what John and, and I are trying to do is just infuse science into the conversation, and that's why we've collaborated now on four different, uh, uh, three papers and, a, and a, a book chapter, and that's our approach. Um, I am active on Twitter. In fact, I'm not even on Facebook, but uh, when the movie uh, thing started happening, I, I talked to John and Carol and Sam. I said, hey, look, I think this is an opportunity for us to uh, use social media in a way that will help, number one, promote the movie and get out the stories that we wanted people to read because up until recently SeaWorld had complete control of the message so number one I think you're on the right track number two just keep doing what you're doing and number three just figure out what you're good at doing whether it's blogging making movies writing books filming these videos it doesn't really matter everyone's got a way to fit in and that's my recommendation you giving you know become educated and give talks right you can give talks as well as uh, anybody if you become educated to the point um, uh, you know, one uh, one of the things I'm always amazed that, you know, my students, right, or college students are right. uh, really good at, you know, using uh, social media. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They've got this thing down, right? I can barely log on to my email and these folks have got it worked out. So, um, you know, boy, that's a great way of disseminating information. Um, and, you know, the, but the number one thing if you uh, disagree with keeping whales in captivity, the Absolutely. number one thing you can do is don't buy a ticket to SeaWorld. Yeah. And let them know why you're not buying a ticket to SeaWorld. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I do want to thank you guys so much for meeting with me. Um, I would like it if uh, if you guys would like. I can send you a copy of my research paper once it's done. We'll love that, yeah. Yeah, and I again, I thank you so much. I can tell you a lot of people at work want to see this interview.